I guess we'll move on to the demo. Mark Dreyer is going to be talking to us tonight. Mark, it's all yours. Thank you. So I assume everybody can see me, everybody can hear me. Um, here's the deal. Uh, when I was talking to Drew about it, this originally, the genesis was that apparently, as you guys mentioned, that uh, Rick gave you guys some glue boost for Christmas. And he said, boy, it would be really nice to have a demo on it. And Rick called me and we talked about doing a demo tonight. And the long story short is we're going to supplement the demo. We're going to do a couple things because quite honestly, when you start to use glue boost, you're going to find you're done in five minutes. It is literally the easiest finish that I ever put on a pen. And so it's, it's got great durability. As I mentioned earlier, it really comes from the, um, the background in high-end in musical instrument repair, if you look on the website, there's, um, you know, guitar repairs and things like that. I'm going to be flat out honest with you. I am not an employee of Glue Boost. I basically just, you know, I think I started using it somewhere around 2018, as I mentioned earlier, at a Midwest Pen Turners gathering, and I haven't looked back. So if you do use it and you check out the website and you check out some of the demos on there, you're going to see demos by myself. John Underhill's got a demo out there on uh, Rick's site. If you go on YouTube, I know a couple other people, including Ed's got one out there. So here's the deal. Over the course of the next, I'm going to say half hour, I'm going to go over Glue Boost. And then I'm going to go over the, the different finishes. Please feel free that you have me for this time. I'm on your time. So ask me any questions that you want. We're going to do things. I do things a little bit differently. We're going to do what's considered the medium first and then the thin. If you want all the theory on it, feel free to ask me. I do have the chat open for those of you who are um, on computers. But for those of you who are at the center, yell out, wave your hand, do anything to get my attention. And I really, really would appreciate it if we are as dynamic as possible. Then the second part of it is, because I didn't want to be done in, in five minutes and have your show end, in five minutes, we're going to go over and we're going to talk a little bit about um, vertical casting. And the difference is I, I was in the video, sorry, I was watching your um, November demo with Eugene and he did a fantastic job on color casting. And that's more of a horizontal casting method. We're going to do a little bit differently. We're going to talk a little bit about vertical casting. And what we're going to get into is the whole world of label casting and embedded objects and things like that. So over the course of, you know, that's going to take another half hour, 45 minutes. So over the course of the next hour, hour and 15 minutes, I am completely yours to ask me any questions that you want and make it as interactive as possible. So are we good? Yeah. All right. So I am playing with some new software. As I told you, I'm using vMix, which I haven't used in the past. So by way of background, um, I've been a pen maker for about 25 years. I've been a demonstrator for the AAW, both in Atlanta, Portland, and if anybody participated in the last June symposium or July symposium, I was the pen making demonstrator there. Um, anybody going out to Chattanooga this year? No? All right, I'm going to be the pen demonstrator in Chattanooga this year too. So I was just going to say stop by and say hi. Um, I also am one of the, the co-coordinators of the International Pen Makers Midwest Pen Turners Gathering. It's in Schaumburg. We can talk a little bit about it at the end. I've done a ton of regional symposiums, local symposiums. If you're familiar with Turn On Chicago, things like that. I've been a featured demonstrator there. I have my own YouTube channel called 10 Minutes to Better Pen Making. So if you're interested in that, please feel free to check out those, um, those videos. And what I do is I try to take a topic and cut it down into 10 minutes. But by the end of this demo, you're gonna realize I can't do anything in 10 minutes. So my, my 10 minute to better pen making was a great brand name that turns out most of my videos are right around 20 minutes. But that being said, um, that's kind of my background. So as I said, we already talked about the, the agenda. It's gonna be glue boost. We're gonna talk about the typical application. I plan on doing it on a light colored blank then we're going to do it on a dark colored blank. Then we're going to talk a little bit about master tint and being able to color your blank. And the beauty of this technique is we're going to be doing things 
that you just haven't seen before. And it's just easy to do it with the glue and with the, um, with the product itself. So as I said, I'm, I prefer it to be interactive. I encourage questions, ask anything you want as we go along. Uh, if you if you know if you have if you are a member of the AAW, um, this was the April issue of last year of 2021, and that is my cover. I like to just show that one too. And we're going to talk about it at the end. We'll know a little bit about how to actually make that pen that you see there and the vertical casting that's on that one. So are we good? So here's what we're yes. going to here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about glue boost, and you can see here by the by the uh, PowerPoint. I basically use colors. So you're going to hear me talk today a lot about orange and blue. And if I look at the orange, the orange is simply the fill and finish thin. And the blue is just fill and finish. Now, if you want to equate this to stuff that you've typically used, this is more considered the medium and the orange is considered the thin. But they are significantly different. Um, these were never intended, you know, a, a lot of the other CA finishes that you see are out there were intended as CA at first, right? So they don't have the flexibility that's out there. This one's already got that built into it. And so, you know, I always like to joke, if you remember when, well, at least when I was young, there was always a guy who would take CA, he would put it on his little helmet and glue himself up to an I-beam. That's not this type of product. This type of product was designed specifically to be a finish. So if you look closely at the label on the bottom, on the bottle, it literally says fill and finish. And this one is fill and finish thin. So with that, let's go to the actual finish. So I assume everybody can kind of see, um, it's a 25 cent piece of maple. And we're gonna see how quick and easy this is to put a, a, just a lasting finish on it. I typically will use a glove. And so I am putting on a, um, a glove. But the nice thing about, about Glue Boost is you can use some of your current technique. You're gonna see here, I'm gonna do things kind of significantly different. Like first and foremost, I am not gonna have the lathe on when I apply my finish to it. And the reason being, it's got a great self-leveling property to it. So I really don't need to have that lathe on. And I, I have a, the viscosity is such that I'm gonna have plenty of time to get this across, rotate this around and get a really, really nice finish on it. So in terms of my setup, you can see here, I'm using the turn between centers bushings. If you haven't used these, you're gonna love them. I love using the turn between centers bushings. This is my live center in my tail stock. This is my dead center in my, in my head stock. And the nice thing about it is when you're doing any kind of normal turning is that I don't have to worry about pressure bending this or doing anything. So now that I've gone to this, this, um, this turn between center system, that's all I ever use. So you can see here, instead of having bushings, I've got these things. These things are dowel ran bushings. The nice thing about it is nothing is gonna stick to it. So I'll take off my traditional bushings after I've rounded my pen down. You can see here, this is really, really thick. It's just simply because that's what I like to use when I'm doing my demos. The other thing that I wanna tell you is when you're gonna try these finishes, there's no reason to not just turn it down so that this is round and put a finish on here. It's a great technique. We've got that over people who do flat work because we can turn something down, just get it round and then put our finish on it. And then we can take it off. Then we can put the finish on again. Then we can take it off. Last thing you want to do is ever try a brand new finish and get the pen all the way down to where you want, try the finish. And if it doesn't come out the way you want it to come out, then you know I've seen tons of people on Facebook going, well, how do I get the finish off? And they'll say, well, sand it off. And then they'll go, well, then I'll be lower than my bushings. Of course you will be. So I like to practice things. So what you see here is I simply got my, my pen blank round. It's about, I don't know, maybe an eighth inch proud of what my bushings would have been. But now I can practice my finish on it. And the nice thing about it is I can really put on 
six, seven, maybe even eight finishes if I'm really practicing with something before I get down to the end. Was there a question? Okay. No, before, no. I, before I get down to doing my finish on it, I can get a whole bunch of practice finishes on here. So if I'm going to be trying a different kind of wood, like um, let's say an, an oily wood, like Coca Bolo. Coca Bolo is traditionally a hard wood to finish, or you know, not a hard wood to finish, but a hard wood to finish. I I will simply turn it down and I'll practice my finish on it. Then I'll either cut it off or sand it off. The worst case that'll happen to you is that you'll put that perfect finish on maybe the second or third time when you're practicing it. And then you go down to the bushings and you don't get it as perfect as you had it. But you know what? It's just a real easy technique. And then, as I said, really invest in a nice set of these Delrin bushings. And it's going to make your life real easy. So there's a lot of voodoo out on social media. And I've seen every single piece of voodoo out there. It's, you know, mix, mix your CA with um, boiled linseed oil, put on, you know, um, you know, three coats of thin, then 10 coats of medium, and then 20 coats of, of thin on top of it. We're not going to do that. In this case, we're going to use no more than five and probably four coats, and we're going to be done. And so my applicant, you know, people will say, you know, try plastic bags, try this, try that. I'm just going to go through my technique and the way that I like to do things. So I've simply taken a piece of blue paper towel, shop towel. It's the Scott shop towel. I folded it up in a nice little piece. And I'm going to go with the blue first. And people are going to go, well, why are you going to go with what's what considered the medium first? Aren't you supposed to put the thin on and then use the, the medium? I like to do it this way because... Now, if I use the medium first, if I actually took this, this blank and I looked at it under a microscope, I'm going to see a ton of little divots in there, right? Because it, that's just the sanding process. I've sanded this blank down through all the common grits, and then I've taken the first two um, series of micro mesh, and that's it. So I've sanded it down. It's, it's very, very, um, very, very fine on here, very easy. So the thing is, I'm not going to need to go back and do anything with that. I'm simply going to take this and start with it at this part. And I'm going to now, I'm going to use the medium to fill in all the little imperfections that I have on there. And then I'm going to use the fill and finish thin, just simply to act as the finish, to do what the finish was intended to do. So you can see here, I'm going to just uncap it. A couple of things you want to know about, um, just the product in general. If you look real close, uh, if you can see it, yep. There's a little nail on the top that will keep your, your product very clean. A couple of things about CA finishes in general, and this is with any CA finish, but specifically with Blue Boost, is you can keep this in the refrigerator up until the point that you open it up. Once you open it up, you know, a lot of people say, well, keep it in the refrigerator. Don't put it back in the refrigerator after that. It is going to thicken it up. And that's not only true with glue boost. That's true with any kind of CA process because of the fact that in your, in your refrigerator, there is humidity. Once you've broken the seal on this one and you have it open, do not put it back in the refrigerator. The other big question that I get all the time is shelf life. Um, I typically will go through this a lot quicker than, than most people, but I have had some that's been on the shelf and I, I know <laughs> friends have had there on the shelf for over a year and never had a problem with it. So here we go. I'm gonna simply take, I'm gonna try to get a dip of it here. So I simply put it on there and now watch, I'm just simply gonna, Lightly rub it. Around the base. This is glue dry. You'll see it when I'm... So I don't know if you saw or you heard. This is a challenge. I'm trying to keep the microscope... Sorry, I'm trying to keep the camera very, very close so you can see how pretty the, the blank is going to be. So with the glue dry, I simply gave it a couple quick spritz. 
This is not a, a spray that you, that you need to put on heavy. So I think that's one of the things that I see a lot of people who are moving over to glue boost when you're first doing it, that's probably one of the biggest mistakes that I see is that they'll pour a ton of glue uh, dry on there. And then they'll say, well, things are caking up. You could see, and we'll do it on the next one. I mean, it's within seconds, I was already, I was already able to touch this. And you, hopefully you can see already. I mean, we're getting a really nice finish and I've got one coat on there. So now I'm gonna just find a clean piece of my paper towel. I'm gonna put a little bit nice bigger glop on that one too. This time I start at the other end of my blank in terms of heads and tails from the tail stock to the head stock. And I put it on. I gave it a couple of quick spritzes. People say all the time, don't use accelerator. And here, I, sorry, I wanted to do that. So you can see I can already grip this. People say all the time, don't use accelerator. Uh, accelerator is gonna cause crazing. Accelerator is gonna cause white spots. Accelerator is gonna cause um, brittleness of the finish. That's not the case with this system. The accelerator is, is there to complement it. And if you look right on the website, <clears throat> or let me show it to you right on here, a little hard to see, but it does say no bubbling, hazing, pitting, just spray it on and go. So they're aware of that. And so all I wind up doing is giving it a couple spritz. Now, in the case that I put it on, it's self-leveling. I don't really have any problems, but if I did have any kind of little nibs, if you will, any kind of little imperfections on the finish, this is four odd steel wool. I'm simply gonna take it and I'm gonna knock it down. And how much pressure are you putting on that steel wool? Very light, very good question. Very, very light. I'm just trying to make sure that I knock out any kind of the nibs on here. In general, everything I'm doing is light. So when I'm actually doing the application, I'm not putting a lot of pressure on it. That's the hardest thing about being a demo is not being able to show you how much pressure that I'm putting on it. But even when I'm putting on the, uh, the applicant, almost no pressure on there at all. So now I'll take a piece of clean blue paper towel and I'm gonna take the fill and finish thin, which is, you know, if anything, it's considered the, the well, the thin. And you can see here it is marked as a flexible finish. So it does have the flex. I know everybody says that, you know, dried wood is dead, but it's not, right? When you go into a pretty humid place, there is, there is gonna be, the wood is gonna move a little bit, no matter what you do. So the nice part about this is, it is got that flex finish on here. So watch, I'm just gonna take a, this one's a little thinner, obviously, so I got the drop on there. I'm gonna hit it real quick. That's it. You can see I can, can you see how quick I can immediately, and I'm trying to grab it hard. I'm trying to let you see my knuckles are getting white because I am trying to grip it. I'll just find another clean spot. I'm gonna take another little drip of it. This time I'll start from the other end. quick spritzes. I'm going to tell you the finish looks pretty good already. But uh, if I wanted to do that last one, maybe I want to, you know, feel free that if you wanted to use the steel wool and knock it down just a hair, you can knock it down just a hair. And I would say we don't need the fifth coat, but let's put it on anyway, just for fun. So I've got just another clean piece. Quick spritz, completely dry. And now basically what you have is you have an acrylic. So this pen is basically already set up to be an acrylic. So these are my micro mesh pads. 
you know, normally I'd spend a little bit more time for the demo sake. I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. So I'm just going to rub it. I like to, with my micro mesh is, this is just a little technique that I like to do. Is that every other one? Is that wet or dry? It's dry. You could do it either way. I like to do it dry only because, you know, my theory is I'd never like to put anything wet near wood anyway. So I'm just going to take this one, go that way. I'm going to go, and normally that's what I would do, but for today, I go through each one of them that way, but I'm going to just, for the sake of the demo, kind of just, can you see the shine line already coming through? And I'm not even at the, the last three that are normally the ones that give you the, the real nice finish. So hopefully you can see that there's a shine line being built up. As I said, I might take a little bit more time doing sanding, but you really don't need to. And then I like to use Novus Polish as my um, finish on it. And then we're gonna go buff it out. So one of the tips that I gave at the uh, AAW symposium is I like to buy Novus Polish and I typically buy the, the one gallon polish of there. And then the problem with that is, is trying to get it on the applicant so that I can get it on the blank. So what I do is I just took a, this is a bottle from a um, hand shop, from a hand soap dispenser. And then simply put the, put the Novus polish in there. So then when I plop it down, I got the Novus polish on there. Is that one, two or three? Two. So, is it noticeable? It is. All right, so I am gonna take it over to my, my buffing wheel just to, to go one step further. So, this is my, one of my favorite parts. I have seen people, so I've got a BL buffing system. You won't be able to see it because it's, it's gonna be off camera. So you won't be able to see my BL buffing system because it is kind of off camera. And my favorite thing that I've ever seen people do is take this blank and then try to hold it up to the BO buffing system. And that's dangerous. So what I have is I've got a, just a bolt. And then I put one of the downrun bushings on it. Oh. Just a bolt, put one of the downrun bushings on it. I'm gonna take it on here like this. And now I can hold this up to my BL buffing system. So give me 30 seconds, or probably not even 30 seconds, I'll be right back. What do you think of that finish? For comparison, for comparison, this was the blank when we first started. That's the same piece of wood. It is literally a glass like finish. And we did it. We did it in, in literally, if I really wanted to do it, I can do it in five minutes. So now I wanna take it and I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna take a dark blank and do it, but I'm gonna do something I haven't done before. I'm only gonna do it on half. So I'm gonna put this on here. Can you turn your light back on? Yeah, let's see if it comes better on the dark that way. Nah, it's a little hard. Okay. You know what? I'm going to do it with the light. I know it's going to be a little hard to see at first, but trust me, at the end, when I buff it out, I'll have it done for you. I'll, I'll we'll do it with the other camera. So once again, now this is just a dark piece of wood. So same thing. 
I'm only going to do, you know, the top end. So I'm doing my blue. And I'm only going to go halfway. Give it a spritz. Completely dry to the touch. And you can see, you know what? If you look real close, yeah, right there, you can kind of see a little bit of the imperfection right up here. So we'll put another coat on and then we'll do some steel wool and we'll knock that imperfection out. So once again, I got a really, really light touch on here. Spray, easy to touch. I'm gonna take my steel wool. Knock it down so that yeah, there's a spot. But you can see how easy it was to knock down any imperfections. Now I'm gonna do the the couple coats of the thin. Quick spray, another coat of the thin. This one I'm trying to do a little bit more conscious of time. So you get an idea that, I, that that's not a lot of magic to it. You simply, as I said, four or five coats and you're done. Couple quick spritz. Now I'm going to go through the sanding. I'm not even going to put the fifth coat on. I'm going to go through my sanding process. You ever run the lathe while you're applying the CA? I don't for the, um, I don't for glue boost in the past. I have, I know that um, other people do. I know John does. I think Ed does. Um, I don't, I just, for me, there's a couple reasons why. The first one is um, I like the viscosity that um, glue boost has, so I don't worry about um, having to get it across. You could see when I was doing it, I had more than enough time to start at one end, go all the way to the other end, and keep working it backwards and forwards. I challenge you to do that with, with um, any of the other ones. And then the other thing is maybe this is just me. Because um, if something bad's going to happen, it always happens to me. Um, the idea of, of, of putting on a CA finish with something spinning and coming, even though you're wearing a mask, I just, I, I just don't like that idea. So I'm a little, for me, it's a, it's a little bit of a safety thing also. So I'm just going to do this on this. As I said, if we're going a demo, this would probably be, you know, I'd probably take a little more time on each one of these. You can see the shine's already building up. So take a clean piece of blue paper towel, put some of my Novus 2 on here. And I'm going to buff this out. And hopefully, I can show you that this one looks like glass, too. Oh, man. Go back at this picture because it looks 
gorgeous. Those turn between center bushings that you're using, are those from exotic plants? Uh, this, this setup? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's, it's called the modify, sorry, it's called the turn between center system. As I said, let me wheel it in. Oh, I can just do that. And put it back where it was. This is my tail, this is my headstock. So it's a dead center. This is my, um, uh, tail stock. So it's got the live center. The only nice thing, if you're going to purchase it through Exotic Blanks, Ed is the only one that's doing this. There's a, to me, if you ask me, there's a fundamental flaw in the design of this thing. If you look, and I know it's really, really hard to see. So let me pull out a pointer. If you look right where this thing is pointing here, there's a little divot here. And then there's one on the other side too, where there's a little bit of a divot there. And if you put too much pressure on, your bushing actually after a while can get stuck in there. So Ed provides them with um, a quarter inch nylon washer. And then you put the nylon washer on this side and the nylon washer on this side and put your bushings against it. And you never have a problem with anything coming in or out. So I hope that I can get, get this on there. Uh, all right, so this is the unfinished side. Uh, it's not doing, I'm not doing this blank justice. Yeah, I'm not doing this blank justice. It's beautiful, the finish on here. But, you know, as you can see, though, I mean, one of the things you can notice, can you see the unfinished side? And then the shot, there we go. That's a little better. And you can see the, just the quilting that's still in there. So, so I wanted to, I, and that one, I just wanted to be a little bit more conscious of that you could see that I'm not, that I, you know, everything I'm saying hopefully is the truth that it is literally, if you wanted to do it, five, 10 minutes and you're done and you've got a lifetime finish on your pen. So any questions on just, I don't know where I'm at on time. Oh, I'm actually pretty good. Um, any questions on just glue boost, the technique, the technique, as I said, my technique in summary, I start with the blue. I put that, I sand down and then I'll use maybe the first one or two of the micro mesh. I sand down, I use one or two, the first two maybe of my micro mesh. And then what I'll do is I will then put on the blue with the blue finish on there. One, maybe two coats on there. Typically always two coats gets me a nice real leveling process on that one. If I needed to, to knock it down, steel wool does it. So I'll use the steel wool and then I'll put two, possibly three coats of the fill and finish thin on top of it. And then if I needed to do any kind of sanding in between, I would just simply use the steel wool on there. Then you could see I could automatically go to my micro mesh. If you're starting out and you're having any kind of challenges with it, one of the things to think of that, that, that's also okay is after you do your finishes on there, your first three coats of the orange, don't feel bad if you have to go back in with 400 wet dry. Use the 400 wet dry. You're, as long as you use a really light pressure, you're not gonna sand through the finish and you're gonna be fine with it. So after that, I run through all my micro meshes when I get it back down. And then, um, I go through, all my micro meshes. And then I basically use the hut, sorry, the Novus, the Novus 2 polish. And then ran it at my buffer. And I'll use the I'll use the maple again because it's just a lot easier to see. Do you use all three steps of the beetle? 
Yes. You know, and people ask all the time, why do you do that? Because um, you're already down. You're already down past, you know, that especially that first one, if I've already sanded it and gone through the micro meshes, I in theory should be down a little bit. The reason is when I'm doing it, when I have it on here and I've got it on here, when I'm applying it to the wheel, I'm not just holding it this way. I'm actually rotating it and going around with it. So if there was any kind of little scratch marks from either going you know, tangential or, or with the grain, I'm gonna get rid of them because I'm moving it all around. So yeah, I, it may not seem that you needed to go through all three of them, but I simply do it because as you could tell, I mean, when I, when I went off camera, how long was I gone? 20 seconds? The extra 10 seconds doesn't kill me. So any questions on the, the finish? Mark, I'm curious. So, you know, is anybody using the, the uh, Blue Blue system to uh, finish bowls? Yes. So I did a demo for um, another club actually out in Texas somewhere and uh, doing it. I will tell you, I am, I am not that great at doing it, but one of the gentlemen down there was experimenting before I did the demo down there, and he was, he was pretty good at, at doing it. Um, I've used it on pepper mills. I have no problem putting it on on pepper mills. Uh, with the bowl, I, when I've done it on there to try to get a bowl, I've done it in sections. So I've done the lower part, and then I'll move up, and then... You know, it's kind of like painting to me. I always wanted to keep a wet edge, but I'm I'm not really being completely transparent. Oops. Being completely transparent, I'm not great at it. So I know that there's there are people who have done it and they use it all the time for, for their finish, even on bowls. Any other questions? All right, so now we're going to do something fun. Now we're going to take as if that wasn't fun. Now we're gonna take this and I'm gonna mount up. Once again, this is just another, for reference, just another piece of maple, 25 cent piece of maple. And I am gonna tint it amber. And so when you guys got the master tint and you said, well, we don't really know what we're going to do with this. Now I'm going to show you what you're going to do with it. So I'm going to put on a new glove. My favorite part is my wife always knows when I'm doing this stuff because um, if I, a lot of times I don't put on the extra glove and either my hand will be um, amber when I'm done or any of the colors. So we're going to basically do the same thing, but I'm not going to use... You know, I'm, I'm just gonna go through the way I do it. I'm only gonna use the thin this time. So I'm gonna put on a coat of, I'm gonna put it on right away, and then I'm gonna finish over it just with the thin. So Master Tint comes in a lot of different colors. This one is, this one's the amber. And it's got all the primary colors. So you can do any kind of mixing and matching. So if you wanted a, a green and you knew that you could mix the blue and the yellow to get the green, you'll, you'll be able to get any of that kind of stuff. There's a nice black here. So if you wanted to do any kind of ebonizing, after I get the blank done, we'll, we'll go through some of the benefits of doing some of the other colors. And there's a white. If you want to do any kind of antiquing, we'll be able to do that. But let's just go through the amber first. And I'm going to show you how I'm going to get a, just a beautiful, you know, it's a differentiated finish, right? So I always tell people when, when I'm doing demos is the whole point of pen making is to be different. So if you ever go to art shows or you go to craft shows and the guy next to you is selling wooden pens, this is the intent of this is to be a little bit different than he does. And I also run a club on um, Saturdays once a month for just pen makers out in the Chicagoland area. And we have contests all the time. One of the contests always is, you know, what can you do to differentiate yourself? So once again, now I've got a 25 cent piece of maple, right? Nothing more. I am gonna take 
my orange. I'm going to make a little bit of a puddle on here. Then I'm going to take my spatula. I'm going to take some of the amber. I'm going to mix it in there. And then I'm going to be able to pick it up with a paper towel. And I'm going to be able to get a beautiful tint on here. So I will tell you, you want to have everything ready to go. So here's my paper towel. It's ready to go. This is one of the areas that Glue Boost is just far superior because of its viscosity and, have, and the open time that it has on it. So I'm going to open the product. There's my, there's my tint. You can see here it is a powder. One of the questions I get all the time is, can I mix other stuff into it, like um, mica powders? The short answer is no. And the reason I know that is because I tried it and it glopped up on me. So these powders are going to work perfectly for it. So we're going to take off, we're going to make a little bit of a puddle. Hopefully you can see that. I'm going to take some of my tint. I'm going to just drop it in there. Maybe a little more, do something a little bit nice and dark. I'm mixing it. Nobody's going to make a Bob Ross comment that I that you you feel like you're watching Bob Ross right now. But see the the whole the fact is we have all this open time. So I'm going to take my paper towel. I'm going to dip it in there. That's in my paper towel. That is different. So what am I going to do? I'm going to hit it with just a little bit of the accelerator. Now, if I wanted it darker, actually, I don't. Yeah, I kind of like it the way it is. But just in case, I'll, I can still dip this in. Got some more on there. I want to make sure that I still get a nice blend. And I think that. Go ahead. Hit it with a couple quick three spritz. I am literally putting my hand on there as hard as I can. You can see how it's it was dry. I'm going to clean this up just because I like to clean up after myself for a split second. So I cleaned up my spatula, if you don't mind, and the palette. Um, I don't know if you got the palette and the spatula as part of its gift, but if you purchase this as Master Tint um, and you buy the set, it will, it will come with the palette and it'll come with these, these spatulas. So now what are we gonna do? We're simply gonna put a couple quick coats on top of it and then I'll sand it out, buff it out and we'll take a look at, at what we got. And that was the uh, orange that you mixed it with, right? Yes, yes, it's the, basically oh, it's really the called the amber. Yeah. The blue boost. Yep. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry, yes. Thank you. I didn't get the question till for a second there. Yes, I used it only with the fill in, um, the, um, the the thin finish. So I only used the orange and the amber and the orange. Sorry, thank you. All right, so I'm going to move this on the side. Now I'm going to put a couple quick coats of the thin on top, kind of just seal it all in. Quick spritz. Notice I'm not heavy on the spray. It's completely dry it's that quick. And if you notice, I mean, that, that's kind of the cool part of the system, right? When it was sitting down here, you saw how long of an open time I had on it, right? I was actually able to go back, dip it in a second time 
and get a little bit more finish on here. But the minute I hit it with the accelerator, I it's dry. And the, the benefit to that is that's why you really want to use the accelerator is that if you don't use the accelerator, sometimes think, you know, CA will finish, will feel dry to you, but it's not really dry. It's still wet from the outside and working its way back in. So I'm going to put just a hair more on here. Start out on the other side. Couple quick spritz. Done. I will take the extra minute to go through my micro mesh and buff it out for you. Can you see the shine line already building in there? Fresh piece of paper towel. Pump from the Novus. Kind of put it on. Kick it out. We'll take it over to my buffer. Mark, you didn't use the steel wool this, this time. Was that intentional? No, it was, you know, for me, it's like 50 50 whether I need to use the steel wool. Um, you know, I only use the steel wool if I feel that, it, that I had any kind of nibs on there. And when you could see when I was grabbing it really hard, I can kind of tell. So, no, if there's no nibs on there, you don't need the steel wool. Uh, if you watch my demos when I first started to do this one, when you watch my demos when I first started to do Blue Boost, I used the steel wool a lot more. But I think now that I've got the hang and the feel of it, I don't need it as much. So I'm going to jump off camera for 20 seconds. Let's go back to the other camera. All right, so remember what we started with? This was the color that we started with. Just so you know that that was the one that we finished. So this is the color that we started with. And there's what we got. Oh, wow. So there, there's bright red. There's blue, there's you know tons of other colors. Now here's the question that people ask all the time. How much of a penetration do you get? So let's say that I didn't really like what I did. Hopefully you can see there, it's a surface finish. Can you guys, if you want to, someone want to nod their head, can you see that it's a surface finish? Yeah. It has a, this was, you know, this is there. Yeah. There's just the spillover from when I was, trying to do the sanding, but you can see predominantly it's a surface finish. So I get this gorgeous surface finish that if I wanted to change out, I'm simply gonna go and I'm gonna take it, I'm gonna sand it out. Does it penetrate the wood any or is it a complete, is it, is it completely surface? It's pretty much only completely surface. Mark? Yes, sir. Is this a good product to use if I want to fill a crack in a bowl? Yes. I I use it a lot for those kind of things. Um, I don't want to get too... So, like, if I'm doing a pepper mill, this is Bacote that I obviously cut too quick and I didn't let dry. I didn't seal it back up after I cut it. I'll pour it in here and I'll fill it in here. I like to use the thin um, only because 
they have the, the, and I'll talk a little bit about it in the next half. There's also a red, which is super thin. I know John likes to use that for doing uh, adhering things to blanks, but yeah, I, I will put it into here. I'll use it to patch things up on, on bowls and platters when I have it at the end, because the nice thing about it is, especially if I'm gonna, like on a pepper mill or something like that, if I'm gonna spray lacquer on top of it, you're not gonna see where I put this in. It, it doesn't have that yellowing or crazing or hardening that uh, other finishes have because, you know, or other patches have, you just won't see it when it's done. So if I have a bowl that I've sanded all the way to where I want it to be, and then I see a crack I need to fill and uh, take a Dremel or whatever and, and make it. So then what do I do to make sure that I don't see a CA uh, glue? Do I put a sanding sealer or what? I don't. I put it right into it. I pour it right. Sorry, I just drip it right out. So all right, I want to make sure that I get this really, really clear on how I answer it. Um, for me, it's the orientation is the hardest part, right? So I want to orient it. So I, I, you know, if it's if it's in the bowl or on the outside, I'm going to take it, I'm going to take the chuck off. I'm going to leave it in the chuck, but I'm going to take the chuck off and I'm going to move the bowl by hand so that wherever I want to do the work on it. Um, let me grab one real quick. This is a plat. Uh, Oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong camera. This is a platter, right? And so if I wanted to, if I needed to seal some part of it up, you know, say here, I am gonna take the whole chuck off the lathe and I'm gonna turn it and I'm gonna hold it so that when I apply it, when I apply the glue, it's only going into the area that I need it to go into. I'm gonna hit it with the glue dry. You could typically then grab it right away and I'm done with it. And then that way, I'm not going to get the drip marks. If I was to put it here and I tried to put the glue on, I'm going to get those drip marks. I'm going to get it here till I get it self-level. And I'm. you want to build the finish on these things. On any kind of these CA products, don't pour a lot of it in and spray it. Pour a little, hit it, little, 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 hit it, hit it, hit it every time. And that's what's going to build you up to having a really perfect finish on here. And then... Typically when you have that, then you're only talking about hand sanding it afterwards. I think a lot of people will put it on, they'll see a little flaw in here, in the rim somewhere, they'll put it in, the glue will drip down, it'll drip all the way down to here. And then this glue that's up on this little corner never gets into it. So I would take it, hold it this way, pour it into here, spray it. The nice thing about it is I'm not, I don't have to take a lot of time. You saw how quick that it dried when I had the spray. So did that answer your question, Chris? Yes, thank you. Okay. Hey, Mark. Yes, sir. Hey, do you have any of them, uh, them little tips you can put on the glue bottle to show them how you can specifically put it in an area without it getting all over the place? That is excellent. Let me go grab one. That's the beauty of doing demos at home. When people ask me questions, I can actually do a couple more. Let me show you one thing that you can get. Yeah. Let me go back to the other camera. You can actually get these whips. Can you see that? It almost looks like a needle. Yep. And it's simply just. I'm having a little hard time here because I think I left too much of the glue on the top. Oh, there we go. Here we go. Uh, I'm having a hard time. I'm fumbling with my fingers right now. But this whip just basically pushes right onto it. And can you see the precision control that I can have with this? So especially when you're using um, like the, the, the wicking one that's in red or something like that, these tips work great. Thanks, John. Mark. Yes. Hello, Mark. Yes, sir. Those come with glue boosts now, at least from us. Okay. Uh, you get two of each of those um, real thin ones and two of the ones that are a little bit larger. 
uh, with every bottle that's, that comes automatically. Okay, this is this is the ultra thin one. This is the what. So you can see how fine I can, and I did get it on the bottle. So you can see how fine I can get. How does that react with acrylic blanks, for instance? You know, sometimes you'll chip one and you want to fill it with a little bit of well, the glue boost. So if you give me a minute, if you give me a minute when we do the next part of the next demo, I'm going to talk about that. But I actually use, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about two different kinds of acrylics. And I will, I think I'll, I'll, I'll address it at that point, if you don't mind, but it works great. I use it all the time for exactly that. For air bubbles, I use it for chip outs. I use it when I want that extra finish that um, Illumilite can't give me. So any questions? How did I do that? How did I do on I was gonna be done in the first half hour with that one? Can you tell one of my videos are no longer 10 minutes? All right, so, the, so um, with that said, I wanted to give you an idea of something else. Uh, this was more of a, a thank you for to Drew for letting me be involved in uh, watching the, the November meeting and watching Eugene. I always like to watch Eugene. I think he's just an exceptional casting person with color casting. And so when, when I was talking to, to Drew about what we could do, I said, well, maybe, you know what, I'll take a half hour and I'll do something that complements what um, Eugene did. And we're gonna talk today a little bit about vertical casting. So give me one second to clean up. I just don't like to have a lot of glue sitting around. Because as I said, if something bad's gonna happen, it is gonna happen to me. So now what we're gonna talk about, and I'm gonna jump back to the other. Let me see if I got anything left here. Actually, right, so yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit now what we call vertical casting. And I'm gonna go through some of the benefits of using a vertical casting system. Uh, things that we can cast that uh, are not color casts, stamps, stickers, carbon fiber, snake skins, watch parts, alligator jawbone, the master of feathers is on the call, uh, abalone shell, crushed pennies. And so let me give you a little bit of an idea what, what we're gonna talk about first, and then we'll go into, we'll cut back over to here. Oh, you know what, this will answer the question that I got earlier. So someone asked about using glue boost over a, an acrylic finish and using it there. And I'll, I'll get into it a little bit more. But if you've ever, you know, I think Eugene is one of the best at, at um, um, you know, what they called worthless wood. And so this is a, a pen that's got a burl on the bottom and then was cast with acrylic on top. And you can see the, the glue boost finish on top of it. The nice thing about it is, you know, what's really nice about it is, you know, you obviously want to protect the wood finish on it. But the nice thing is because there's acrylic on there, I can use that same finish and I can get it over both. So what we're going to talk about now is vertical casting. Some of the things that we can do with it. This is a walking medallion over a label. This one's just another walking medallion over a label. I love doing these. This is Japanese paper. So when we're talking, this is the difference, right? We, you saw, you're getting the whole master's degree but from last month, from November now into this month. Last month, you, you figured out how to do all the color casting. Now you're gonna know how to do all this label casting. This one is a Crush Penny from Disney World. It's a Star Wars Crush Penny. You get to do things like this. A friend of mine's an eye doctor. So what a novel Christmas gift. Gave him a pen with an eye chart. 
including all the different ranges. So now as you're looking at this, do you like it now or two? One or two? Come on, someone's got to laugh at that one. One or two? Okay. Um, postage stamps, we're going to talk a little bit about that. This one's a back of a playing card. I typically don't like, I typically only show stuff that I've done because I get nervous about it. But since John's on the call, if you haven't seen any of his work, this is Amherst pheasant. And those are the real feathers under there. I think we're going to have to get John signed up for a demo too. Well, if you're if you're free, <laughs> if you're available, uh, February nineteenth, that's the AW's uh, IRB. John and I are doing a. Uh, we're both going to be doing a demo on that day, for for them. If you're gonna, you're you know, I'll talk about it in a minute at the end too. If you'll indulge me about the Midwest Pen Turners gathering, that um that uh, John and I will both and Ed will both be involved with. But uh, yeah, if, if you haven't had them, you definitely want to have John in there. And then one of my favorites, to watch face. So the last three, I, I take no credit for other than I turned them. So that's a watch face. Another idea, another take on a watch face with all the little gears in there. Now, the thing about this one is that there's a glue boost finish on top of it. That gives me, you know, I, I know these cameras are hard to do this. And so hopefully just nod your head if there's an appreciation that you can see how, how deep that coloring is on here. When, in your hand, this is just completely a beautiful blank. And then finally, I like this. This is an alligator's jawbone. And so this is this is a little bit different. Hopefully, you'll get a difference in appreciation from what we do, from what uh, Eugene did, and this will complement what he did. So I'm going to go back here. I'm going to take. So as Eugene mentioned last time, he likes to use alumolite. For me, alumolite is is this is just my personal opinion. Alumolite is great for doing in the embedding. So if you're doing the color casting that that Eugene's doing. It's a great one. If I'm doing the alligator jawbone, it's once again, it's another great finish, sorry, another great casting agent for doing any of that kind of stuff. The nice thing about it is it, it doesn't have a lot of smell. So you can do it at your house. Um, I typically, when I'm doing any of the clear casting in terms of label casting, if I can, I'm gonna try to use Silmar 41. And the reason is I get a little bit more vibrance out of it. So if I cut and I show you this, hopefully we can get this on camera. Yeah. These are two label casts. It's the uh, second amendment on a bolt action pen. These were done about, uh, I'm gonna say six or seven years ago when I was doing some demos. This one down here is Silmar 41. These are two labels done exactly at the same part. This one's done in Silmar 41. So you can see the tremendous shine on that one. This one's done with a Loma light. And it's just got a little less, little less vibrance on it. But if I wanted to, I put a CA, I put a glue boost finish on top of it, and I'm gonna bring that out. So when we were looking at what Eugene did, let's just go back. I'm gonna just go to my just me talking here. Under the under the the thing here, Eugene typically was doing color casts, and he was doing it in something like this, right? One of these kind of molds. When we talk about vertical casting, we're going to do something completely different. I'm going to start here with our end goal, and then I'm going to work backwards. This is our end goal. We're going to use a plastic tube. We're going to use something here on the ends. They're going to make sure that our resin doesn't creep inside the plastic tube. We're going to get some sort of mechanism on it to center the top and the bottom. And then what we're going to do, and see if we can do it there. Yep. We're going to put it vertically 
inside my casting system, and then we're going to put it in a pressure pot. But let's go over. Let's go over the tips and the tricks to get to to get to do to to get to do this. Now, the first thing that you need to do is you're always going to start out with your tube, right? And so this tube is for a gear shift pen. And if you've ever drilled a gear shift pen, you know that uh, um, we're going to make a label up for it. So let's take a let's take a look at a, a label we might want to make for it. So here's a here's a picture. First thing I'm going to warn you about is copyright. So just because you can take a picture off the internet and print it out, this is printed on um, uh, self adhesive paper. Doesn't mean you're entitled to do that one. I love all the people out there who are doing um, casting and they're doing label cast and they just simply go and they find their picture of their favorite baseball team and they put it on a label and they go and they think that they can sell that blind. You can't. You have to have rights to the image. So in this case, I know the person who owns the car. So I know that this is, this is going to be on a gear shift pen. And so doesn't that make a really nice little um, keepsake? It's going to be a gear shift pen with the picture of the car on there for the person. So I need to first figure out how to make this label. up. And I've got a whole video out there called 10 Minutes to Better Pen Making and how to make the label up. So for sake of time tonight, how long, what time do I got? What time do I have to be done? 8.30. Okay, we'll be right there. Um, I'm going to leave the last 15 minutes, hopefully for questions. So, so I want to, first thing I want to do is I want to figure out what size I want to do on here. So I'm not going to bore you with the details. There's a, there's a video out there called 10 minutes to better pen making, but basically we have to get the height and the width, right? So if I know, then I'm going to drill this pen that the tube here, the, the, the diameter of this tube is three eighths. We know how to find the length, right? The length is going to be real easy. Right? I just basically open up my tape measure. I put it at the number one mark. I measure it out. It's one, two, and a quarter. And then I'm going to add a 16th to it. So I'm just a little bit over two and a quarter. So I need to figure out though, what's the width of my image, right? So I know how long my image is. I'm gonna figure out the width. So this is three eighths of an inch. How do I figure out what the width is? Anybody? Circumference. That was ID. what I wanted you to say. ID. So, so most people will say you take the circuit, you take the radius and you go and then you multiply, you get the diameter and then you multiply it by pi and all that other stuff, right? Here's the easier way of doing it. I'm going to take the two. I'm going to take a piece of blue paper to blue, um, tape. I'm going to wrap it around there. And notice I offset it just to here. Can you see that I offset it right there? I'm going to take a pen. I drew a line. Now when I take it apart, can you see it? Now all I gotta do is take my tape measure, measure it. I typically add a 16th of an inch to all sides. And that's all covered in that, in that other video. So that all makes sense to you? All right, I wanna get to the system. So I'm not gonna talk a little bit, a lot about the details. So now, I printed this off on its online labels. And this is basically a full sheet of label paper. So it's, um, you can see here, it's peel and stick. And it's a complete sheet of label paper. If I was, if this image wasn't so easy for me to see and when I'm going to cut it out, If it wasn't that easy to see, when I printed it out, I would print a bounding box around it. So maybe the image has got some white in it. I print a bounding box around it. 
But now I simply pull it off. I cut it out and I'm gonna wrap it around my brass tube. And simply, let's see what the bottom is. Putting it under, catching it, and rolling it up. Now, the thing about doing this is if you if you blow it and you want to go to take and pull this paper off to reline it, throw it out. Don't try to save this image. If you put it on and there's a bubble in there or you've got a mistake in there, throw it out. When you go and you pull it out, no matter what you do, you think you've got it fixed. I've never had really good luck with it. I've had it that it, it just doesn't, it doesn't, the wrap, the seam doesn't hold or something doesn't hold. I like to use, I might be one of the only people, these are RC car scissors. So if it is a little bit over, like here, I'll just clip that off. And now I'm gonna get ready to do my casting. So this was the way that people used to do the casting or still do, some people will still do casting that way. I'm gonna show you the benefit of, of this system. So this is, as you probably saw when I was talking about it, this is the underhill casting method. I didn't really didn't, we didn't really talk a lot about this in the past because one of the challenges with, with doing this is having to go out and try to buy all the parts and source all the parts on your own. These tubes, you have to buy them in a gross and it could be a couple hundred dollars to get them. So now this is all in a system and that's why John is here to, to make sure I don't say anything bad, but this is all a complete system that he developed and he's got out on the market. And so I'm gonna show you how easy it is. So one of the hugest benefits to the system as you can tell right away, is that I'm not gonna have to have a different mold. When I use these things, I gotta have a different mold every time I wanna do one, right? If I'm gonna do a tube that's a lot longer, I gotta have a different mold. If I'm gonna do a tube that's wider, I've gotta have a tube that does a different mold. In the system, the way you get it, these tubes come, so let's switch cameras. So the tube comes long enough that you can get, you know, at least two full-size pens out of there. You can probably get three, maybe even a fourth Sierra or a bolt action out of it. So you get the tubes this way, right? And what we, as I said, what we want to get down to is getting it to look. like this. What we're gonna do when we have it like that, we're gonna pour in our casting resin on there. So the, let's start, and we're gonna start building this from the bottom up. So these are Delrin bushings. You know what, I'm gonna go to the other camera. These are Delrin bushings, or little pieces of Delrin that have been cut, and they've got a chamfer in there, and then there's a nail head that's perfectly aligned in the center. So what we're gonna do to get our blank on that is in the next part of the system, we're gonna use these plugs. So the plugs, there's two different size plugs. The first set of plugs will basically cover 90% of everything that you're doing. So if you're doing Sierras, you're doing bolt actions, you're doing the fishing pen, you're doing the um, um, uh, diamond neural, you're doing a Wall Street, these work perfectly on it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm, you can, kind of, you can almost see where the center of this is just by the coloring. So I'm gonna take the, Take the tube and press it in. Are we good so far? Are we good on pace? 
I got a couple head nods, so we're good, right? And so now you can see I'm almost halfway there, right? Now the magic in the system is I'm going to just take this down. I'm going to take one of the tubes. I'm going to figure out where it is down here. And then for me, it's probably about a half inch over where it's going to be. And then I'm simply going to take my scissors and cut it. I'm going to cut it off camera. I knew that would, I knew that would drop. You can see I took the long tube and I cut out the part that I need. So now the next thing is we need to get this here over this. And I know a lot of people, you'll just take it and you'll try to force this in. And I've learned from the master, there's an easier way of doing this, right? These, these bushings here are set for a perfect diameter for the tubes. So then this way, you're not going to get any kind of leakage that's there. So if you, you know, if you take your thumb and you simply roll it and roll it and roll it around, you kind of just form the tube a little bit. But now I've got a little bit of room on this tube so that if I take the Delrin and I put it on there and I, I'm gonna do it on camera. Start it at a little bit of an angle and push down. It's sealed off on there. And you're gonna go, well, Mark, that's flimsy on the top. That's not perfectly centered. And I'll agree, it's not perfectly centered. So now what we wanna do is we wanna get that perfectly centered. So what we're gonna do is take one of these centering clips And I'm just unknotting one. So this is a centering clip. It'll make sure that we're perfectly centered on the top. So I'm going to take another one of these stoppers. You can kind of see where I want to go in, right? So I get it there and I get it lined up. So now I got the stopper, right? So I pull back this, right? Now all I'm gonna do, I'll say that you're threading it. You're not really threading it. You're just getting it. So that stopper goes over that tube, right? You can see I'm, I'm off on where I'm at. So I just line it up, push it together. And now when I look over it, it's centered. And if I needed to adjust it, I just move this thing a little bit. But can you see the significant advantage now to what we've done? Now we don't need a different mold for everything that we're ever gonna do. Every time that we wanna do something like this, I just cut this down and I do whatever I want to whatever tube size I want. It, it is a resin saver, right? Because now I'm gonna take my resin and I'm gonna pour it in here. And I'm gonna show you this now. I'm gonna cut back to the big screen. But you can get these caddies. Let's see, I'll pull the light on this one. There we go. I got the caddy and this caddy can hold uh, what 18, 18 different pen blanks on there. You know, when you're starting, that's going to be a lot. Start out easier, build your way up into this one. There's also one that holds 36 of them. But now I just simply put that in. And then the nice thing about this caddy, it'll fit in all the different kinds of pressure pots. I'm going to tell you, casting in general, 
I could spend, and I'm, you know, I, I consider myself average at this. Um, I could spend two hours just talking to you about doing casting. And if you wanted a demo on that one, as I said, either come to the MPG, you could probably talk to John about getting a demo on something like that and spend two hours on the casting aspect of this. So I want to give you an overview. I want you to understand the differences in vertical casting from doing it in horizontal casting and doing simple color casts. This leaves you the ability to personalize everything. So now you got this nice little handle. I've got this up. I fill up every one of these. And then I'm going to take it over to my pressure pot. I'm going to put it down in my pressure pot, put the cap on here, tighten it all down. And I'm going to then pressurize this so that I have everything ready to go. If I'm doing Silmar 41, which is what I'm doing, I'm going to spend, I'm going to let it sit in the pressure pot at least a day, 24 hours. That's just me. If you're doing a Lumalite, you can pull it out probably in 90 minutes, as Eugene said, 90 minutes, maybe two hours, and I'm able to pull these things out. So any questions on, on the setup? You, you mentioned that you don't have to have do molds every time. Do you spray those with like a mold release or do they just pop out or are they one and done? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how to pop them out in a second, but no, we don't spray them with a mold. I don't spray them with a mold release. The plastic part, this tube yeah. is disposable. Oops. This tube, we're going to, we're going to actually turn that off as part of the, as part of the turning process. Okay. So as I said, one of the biggest challenges to doing this one was sourcing these, sourcing these, sourcing the tubes, getting that all done. So that's why we, I started talking a lot more about this one. I'm going to demo this at, um, in Chattanooga also, but I've got an hour and a half session for that one. So any questions on, on the, on the, you know, the basic components of putting this together? I'm looking for my, my one that I had, but basically I'm going to start out with the little part on the bottom and I'm going to build my way to the left. So I use a plug. I put the tube in there that I've got the plug matched up. I use the nice little top off here. I put a plug on that. I find out where I want to cut this. I cut it with the screw with a, um, just a standard um, scissors. I took my thumb. I pulled my thumb around the bottom of it so that I get this to pull in. And you can see here, I mean, that's a nice little fit on there. Nothing's gonna come out of here on the bottom of it. And then I put this in, put it in my caddy and away I go. Any questions on, on that part? Either the, the system is phenomenal or I am such a good description that there's no questions. Is those parts easy to, to source? I'm sorry? Are those parts easy to source? You can source all the parts independently. Um, it does come, I don't want to make it a commercial, but I will make it a quick one. It does come in a complete kit that you can get at Exotic Blanks with John, John's complete casting system. This, the kit comes with um, all the, all the tubes that you need to get started. I think that there's maybe a, a dozen of the, the longer tubes in there. It comes with all the plugs. It comes with all the, the toppers. And it comes with all the, the Delrin on bottom. The other thing that you get with it, and I love this part, are the little black caps. And, you, and you're gonna say, well, Mark, what do I need to use this little black cap for? Let's say that I wanna cast something else. Let's say I wanna cast that, um, so this cap, I'm gonna to go to my other camera. So the cap on here, now I can use this tube. Let's say that I wanted to do a, a kitless pen and I wanted to do a little bit longer of a cast. I can put it in here. But what I love to use these things for, <clears throat> is here's that alligator jawbone and that alligator jawbone pen that we were that we showed how to make. I can simply take 
fill this up part way and push my alligator jawbone down into it. Fill it all the way, the rest of the way up with resin. And now I've got that completely encased. It, it's nearly impossible to do it horizontally. When I'm trying to do it, if I tried to do a horizontal cast of this one, I'd have to cut this jawbone into all the horizontal parts and trim it all off and get all the edges. I can do that right now with this. So the, the interesting thing is all these little parts come out longer. So in short, yeah, you can source all these little parts. Um, you can get it also as a complete kit from exotic lengths. Did that answer your question? Yes, sir. Once you get the kit, and you need more of the tubes or more of the pink plugs. Do you just get those from exotic blanks too, or do you have to buy? So yeah, you can get that. You can get the tubes from exotic blanks, but those plugs, with care, you're gonna get. I'm gonna say you can get, let's say, at a minimum three dozen casts out of a plug, and you could probably get a little bit more out of it, out of each one of those plugs. And let's get to that now. Let's let's talk a little bit about about that part. So what camera am I on? So here's one that was, uh, nope, let me do this. Here's one that's a little bit thicker, but you can see here, so it's using a different color plug and a different color plug on top, right? And so all we're gonna do is we're gonna take a razor blade, and then I'm gonna put it on the, can you see where I'm cutting? This is the bottom where that white Delrin rod is in. So I'm gonna basically take this and I'm gonna score it. And I'm gonna just keep walking my way around. Actually, I'm gonna do one thing first. I should have done something first. But basically you can see here what I did was I scored the bottom of it, right? Now I'm gonna take the top out. If you go to pull it out, and let's say that that plug sits in there. In this case, yeah, the plug sat in there. All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna continually unthread it off. So that this is completely reusable. I'm gonna save this plug. I wanna use this plug again. I wanna use this plug as, you know, as any wood turner will tell you, I wanna use this plug a thousand times if I can. So I'm gonna take these, Basically, it's a, a fine tip needle nose plier. And just find that little middle spot. And I pulled it out. So now this plug, completely reusable. I can use this plug. I have no idea how many times, how many times I can use this plug. But as I said, it's, it's in dozens of time. This part, we're gonna turn off, but now what I've done on the bottom, I've scored it with a razor blade. And then I'm gonna just, I don't know if these are gonna work very well, but I'm gonna use channel locks. And if I just take it and give it a little bit of a twist, I'm gonna do it on this one since I know that I already have it. If I take it with the channel locks and give it a little twist, that one popped out. That was the one that I was scoring before. So now I've got it looking like this. I can use my scissors and cut off the rest of this part. And then I'm gonna go and I'm gonna trim this off and trim this off. I typically will use a bandsaw to get it close because there's the plug, I've saved the plug and everything else. Now, one thing I wanna warn you guys on when you're doing label casts, so I've got this here and I've got, let's say that I did that, you know, I did that, the 57 Chevy, the car in there on the, on the cast. I know a lot of people like to use um, those pen mills. 
and they're going to trim it down right to the edge on those pen mills. I'm going to tell you, that works great on wood. That works great on a completely solid color blank. I don't want to do that on something like this. Because if that pen mill just catches that label anywhere, it's going to tear it. And so what I use, and I know that there's a million different names for these things. I use this thing. Uh, we'll go back. I keep cutting a lot. Oh, that, that works out great. I use that. It's a sanding block or a V block. And you can see it's got a little V channel on here. And so what I need to do is I go to Harbor Freight, I buy a set of punches, I find the punch that fits perfectly into that, the pen tube that I'm going to work. Right, so you can see that it fit in there perfectly. I'm going to unscrew this. Oh, sorry, let's assume that this is the cast one. Let's assume that I already had this thing cast and that there's tons of acrylic on it. And then I'm going to take it to my sanding center. And then when I put it into the sanding center, I'm gonna hold it up against the miter gauge and I'm gonna slowly push this in. Now the sanding center, the chances of me catching something here are a lot smaller because that sanding center is just gonna rub against it. So I'm warning you, when you start to do label casts, invest in getting one of the blocks. And especially if you're gonna do any, any of that, you know, a lot of it, because you really don't wanna catch the end, especially things that have any kind of depth. Carbon fiber is a good one. And you'll see people clip it and they'll catch that carbon fiber and it'll twist. And then they'll go and they'll put it in and they'll go, well, why are there little white spots on the end? It's because when you got that twist, this is my opinion. I might be the only one who thinks this. But when I got that little twist, that was enough of it to twist that out. And then that acrylic, the Somar 41 or the Lumalite that was sitting on top of it, lost its adhesion right at that point. And now I've, I've put in an air bubble well after I've done any of the casting. So if you're gonna do a lot of kind of label casting or you turn any of these kind of things, invest in one of these things. So let me go back to the question that was on the table. So if I want more tubes, you can get these at exotic blanks. If I wanted any more of the plugs, I can get them there. But really, the only thing that I think you know most people are ever going to be buying extra are the tubes. The, the plugs, these, these little, um, I love these things. But the, the center stoppers, you're gonna, these will last you hundreds and hundreds of casts. Is you're gonna be able to have no problem with that. Um, I don't know what else to what else to add on on any of that. As I said, the big advantage is that the big advantage is that I don't need a separate mold for every single time that I'm gonna do a different one of these. And you really can't do them in something like this. So I am ready for questions. I've got, and then I do have, if it's okay with you, I have a 30 second commercial to tell you about some other opportunities if you want to learn a little bit more about casting. If you don't let me do it, that's fine. But I got a couple quick slides on that one. Okay, so if it's okay to do it. <laughs> See the investment opportunities, or <laughs> wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> hey, any anybody who's been a long-term pen turner, you know that it's you're investing in tools and you're investing in toys. I do have a question. Can you put back up the the slide that had the different types of casting material on them? Sure. You've been saying Silmar 41, but I think it said Silmar 42. That's what was my confusion. Silmar 41. Oh, okay. That's a one. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, it's no problem. 
Um, you know, the other thing about, so a couple warnings on this one as you're doing it. Summer 41 has a, a much better vibrance, um, but it does have a, a, a smell to it. I love the smell to it. I don't mind it at all. It's got a very sweet smell to it. And I know a lot of people are doing things with epoxies. I didn't really talk about that on the slide. Um, I, you know, for, for this is just me personally. I'm not a huge fan of epoxy only because it takes seven to 10 days probably to cure. And then I don't think it ever cures. I find that once I turn it, it's still never really, really hard all the way through. It makes a beautiful river table. If you're doing anything on there and you're looking at river tables or you're doing any kind of flat work and you're gonna only sand off a you know, 16th of an inch on it, epoxy is the way to go if you can't have a pressure pot. But if you've got a pressure pot and you can pressurize it, I'm gonna do one of those two different techniques. You know, I don't want to beat the dead horse. So safety is a must. Um, gloves, eye protection, uh, molds, things like that. This is this is the cast <laughs> we just talked about. This is the plugs that you get, the Delrin that you get, the two different caps, the tubes, the racking system that you get. Um, you can see here, this is cactus. And so you can use these tubes to do cactus. As I showed you, I did one with... Um, Alligator jawbone, that's a pack rack. The pressure pots, Harbor Freight works perfectly fine. I don't have any kind of problem with Harbor Freight. Um, if you're gonna do a lot of it, the one on the right is CA Technologies and I like that one also. I've never had a problem with my Harbor Freight as long as you know you take routine maintenance and you make sure that you are Take the time to make sure that everything is lined up at the beginning. I've never had a problem with it. So if you'll indulge me in two quick comments or commercials, uh, if you're available, April 22nd and 23rd in Chicago is the Midwest Pen Turners Gathering put on by Pen Makers International. Myself, John, and Ed are three of the coordinators who put this together. You're going to get two full days of demonstrations. There's probably at least six to eight hours in um, casting alone. You'll get demos from some really, you know, some really big names also. I, I assume here you guys are probably familiar with Dick Singh. Dick Singh will be doing a demo. Ed does a demo. Um, Fred Wisson from P-Town Subby does a demo. Uh, we've got demos for doing kitless pens. We've got some other demos coming up. This is a fantastic event. It's $40. It's just outside of Chicago. In 2019, when we did it, we had about 320 pen makers attend. In 2020, we had to postpone it, obviously, because of COVID. So we did a virtual. I don't know if anybody here attended the virtual, but we had well over 500 pen makers at the virtual. We are going live again with that. You mentioned where can you see John? Save the date, Saturday, April 19th, three o'clock Eastern time. John and I are doing a demo for the AAW. I think this is probably one of the best values out there. It's um, I think for, a, for a member, it might only be 10 or $15 for a non-member. It's maybe $15 or $20. I'm gonna do the first, and we'll watch if everybody wins what I say. I'm gonna do the first half hour on actual pen making. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, you know, kits and things like that, which is my, you know, something I do a little bit more. And then John's gonna spend, you know, an hour talking about covering all the finer intricacies of casting and how to do uh, vertical casting on that one. And then the AAW in Chattanooga is June 23rd through 26th. As I said, um, I'm, the, I'm the pen guy there at that event. So if you're coming out and you decide to come out, please stop by and say hi. I think, oh, you can always, you know, you can always feel free to contact me. Um, it's mark at markdryerturning.com. So you can go on my website. Feel free to send me any kind of questions you have, any kind of follow-up questions on that one. I know Drew has my other emails on there. He can feel free to share it. When you're starting to play with Glue Boost, feel free to ask me anything there. When you're playing with the vertical, if you decide to go vertical casting, ask me any questions on, on that website, I answer them. Sometimes it does take a little bit of time, 
in terms of it may take me a couple of days, but I try to get to everybody. And then that's it. All right, thank you. Any other questions for it? Yeah, I have one more question. When you're sure. putting the glue boost on a wood blank, what grit do you stop sanding? So I, when I sand, when I sand, so for prep work, I'll go through whatever I start with. You know, I, I typically don't, after I'm done turning, I'll, I'll let's say 180 or 220. Okay. I'll start there. I'll work my way up every single grit. So I'll do, if I do 180, I'll do 220. Then I'll do 320. Then I'll do 400. The 400, I like to use the wet dry, but I use it in dry mode. And then I'll do the first two of the micro mesh pads. I'm, I'm talking about the, the wood blank itself before you put the glue on. Yep. No, yeah, I do. I do it through the 400 and then I'll do the first two of the micro mesh pads on the wood itself. And then I'll, then I'll put my glue boost finish on it. And then I'll start back in with the top level of the micro mesh and work my way through all of them. Did that answer it? Yes. Okay, hey, any other questions? You know what, and do me a favor, if you guys, when you guys start to do this, let me know how, let me know what your experience is, how on it, send me, send me any kind of questions. Okay, we sure will. So Mark, I appreciate your time. And thanks for the demonstration. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, sir. No problem. Thanks for, thanks for taking the time to ask me out. Come again. Yes, please. No problem. Maybe next time, maybe next time we'll see, we'll somehow see each other in person. There you that go. That would be great. <laughs>